for uh, staying over time for my presentation. I really appreciate it. And I will go through the slides as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Pranav. Uh, I work in the lab of Dr. Barry Lutz. And my project involves building a physiological simulation system uh, for testing uh, the performance of hydrocephalus shunts. So what is hydrocephalus? This poor infant that you see right here is suffering from what is called hydrocephalus, which is a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid within the brain, which is produced by the brain normally for the purposes of pushing the brain against damage and nourishment, tends to build up within the brain within great excess amounts because of physiological impairments in normal reabsorption and drainage of the CSF that is produced. CSF is short for cerebrospinal fluid. So the scary statistic is that hydrocephalus is way more common um, as a pathology than one might tend to think. Uh, one in 500 babies are born annually with hydrocephalus, and making that makes it as common as Down syndrome, and even more common than spina bifida uh, and brain tumors. Now, although it's com it commonly tends to be associated with pediatric cases, there are a number of older adults living in this country, hundreds of thousands, uh, with what is known as normal pressure hydrocephalus. And normal pressure hydrocephalus is basically hydrocephalus occurring within an adult, which causes uh, so much brain damage that it causes Parkinson's-like symptoms because the dopaminergic neurons in the brain are damaged because of the expansion that results from the buildup of CSF. So cur currently, the, the most common way to treat hydrocephalus is surgically implanting what is called a shunt. And this right here is a picture of a shunt that's been implanted uh, in, into a child. So a shunt, uh, the shunts were, were invented in the 50s, and they've changed relatively little since then. And their main design is a purely mechanical design which involves just acting as a tube that drains the CSF uh, away from the brain and into the abdominal cavity. Uh, and there's a certain uh, intracranial pressure which directly relates to the amount of CSF in the brain that's called the opening pressure. And that's the pressure at which this part of the shunt called the valve opens and lets the CSF flow. So the three basic parts of the shunt are the proximal tube, which goes from the brain to the valve, and the valve is normally anchored to the top of the skull, and then the distal tube, which drains from the valve uh, into the abdominal cavity. However, these shunts, uh, since their time of invention, uh, have been um, a big pain uh, because they're highly susceptible to failure. Mainly because uh, they tend to get clogged and obstructed because of uh, par particulates in CSF, like cells and protein, tends to crowd up along the valve and clog it. And they all, they're also known for causing the opposite scenario, draining too much CSF, causing uh, intracranial pressure, or ICP, to drop way below normal, leading to collapse of the brain uh, and herniation. Some scary statistics. Of the 40,000 annual shunt procedures, uh, which is uh, on average one every 15 minutes, only 30% only uh, are first time procedures involving implanting a shunt into the patient for the first time ever. And if that wasn't scary enough, 50% of implanted shunts fail within two years of being implanted, with almost all of them failing within 10 years. So uh, Dr. Barry Lutz's lab decided to take on this issue with a novel approach, what we call the smart shunt. In simplest terms, a smart shunt is a battery-operated electronic shunt uh, that is meant to be uh, sensitive in terms of sampling uh, ICP, so it can better regulate CSF, preventing problems like overdrainage and uh, to have an ex externally acting valve that does not directly contact CSF, thereby preventing uh, CSF particulates from crowding around a very uh, convoluted uh, mechanical valve system that leads to obstruction. However, the Smart Shunt 2 has its set of limitations currently. Uh, and the, the Barry Lab has recently uh, just finished building a Smart Shunt. And power consumption is a major limitation. This is a battery operated shunt and we would want the battery to last long enough uh, to drastically reduce or even uh, ideally completely eliminate the need for revision surgeries. And that's where my project comes into play. Due to the, the highly sensitive and dynamic nature of the smart shunt, we would need to build a physiologically accurate dynamic testing system uh, in order to optimize the shunt and, or, and in order to test it, in order to make sure it behaves the way we want it to behave. So you might ask, why, why do we need a testing system? Why is the testing system so important? And here's why. So 
this right here is an MRI image of CSF circulating within a person's brain. Um, and there are CSF, uh, as you can see, CSF is pulsating within the brain. And this image really drives home the point that the brain is a dynamic system. ICP is constantly changing even within me right now as I'm standing here talking to you. It, it changes uh, every time my heart beats, every time I take in a breath, and the system itself is highly dynamic. So in order to replicate it, we would need a dynamic testing system. So this right here is a schematic of my testing system. Basically, it can all be uh, diluted down to two tanks, one which represents the brain and the other the abdomen. And there are speakers uh, outfitted in each tank, which pressurize the air uh, on top of the water in each tank, which represents intracranial pressure for the brain and intra-abdominal pressure for the, for the abdomen tank. And then a shunt connects the two tanks, and a pump circulates CSF through the two tanks. And all of the pressure and flow data is processed through data to a data acquisition box into a software called LabVIEW. LabVIEW is also used to control the system to change the frequencies of these speakers and so on and so forth. So this is an actual picture of the system. Here are the tanks, uh, lab is running here, and then uh, here are the speakers. Okay, so this is taken right out of the literature. This is what physiological uh, ICP looks like for a short time course of 40 seconds in a person who is, well, breathing and whose heart is beating, who's alive. Um, and these, so, so when I first looked at this, I, I asked myself, what is it about this that I need to replicate in my testing system? Well, there's first of all the, the cardiac pulses. Each one of these little blips right here is a pulse in ICP that, that corresponds to one beat of the heart. About four or so of these correspond to respiratory pulse, and these big waves and troughs uh, are what are known as slow waves. They're idiopathic, but they are physiologically expected. So I input this into LabVIEW, uh, you know, had my speakers recreate the scenario, and collected the data, and this is what I got. Now, uh, I also wanted to add some randomness to the system simply because physiology as we know it is not completely predictable. So I added some noise. And this is the final data that I got with noise uh, input into it. Next set of tests that I ran uh, is I actually uh, connected uh, one of the shunts that are currently on the market, which is a Medtronic Strata, uh, to my testing system. And I tested it under various pressures and measured the flow rate with oscillations from the speaker and without oscillations from the speaker. And this is where things got really interesting. So, with oscillations, I noticed that the opening pressure of this valve occurs sooner. And this, I think, th this data, my findings here really drive home the point of why a testing system would be really important. Uh, why a dynamic testing system would be important. Because it really uh, shows us the, the various possibilities. It shows us how you know, adding something more dynamic like oscillations can change valve behavior. And this is valuable information that we can take into account when we're programming and optimizing our smart chart. So in conclusion, the goal of the smart shunt is to be a failure resistant shunt, to bring down the uh, obstruction and over drainage that have plagued so many patients with so many revision surgeries time and again. And the purpose of my simulation system is to make sure that this smart shunt works the way it should, in order to optimize it and test it under the right dynamic physiological conditions. And one future goal that we can all look uh, forward towards with the smart shunt is the opportunity to provide personalized treatment. And as we can all know and acknowledge and understand, each person's brain is different. And the way it's going to operate uh, under pathological conditions is also going to be different. So creating a shunt that can be personalized to tailor the needs of the patient will be uh, something, uh, will be a remarkable goal to look forward to in the near future. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lutz for uh, helping me through this project every step of the way. He's a genius and a visionary. Uh, and uh, he, uh, his area of expertise is microfluidics, but his knowledge of manipulating fluids for engineering purposes has really helped this project move along. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, thank many others for helping me uh, you know, set up the testing system uh, and also conceptually think about the way it works. And mainly uh, Dr. Uh, Sam Brout, uh, who is a pediatrician off of, pedi pediatric neurosurgeon off of Seattle Children's, who conceived of the need uh, for a more failure resistant shunt. And if it wasn't for Dr. Brout, this project wouldn't exist. And uh, questions? So is this something that you, I guess you talked about it in a pediatric sense, is this something you grow out of and you develop the ability to control your fluid uh, volume better? Not really, which or is why not the shunt is necessary. So um, unfortunately, it's, it's, one of, it's one of those things that's going to stick with you throughout your life. 
Uh, in some cases, it's more bearable than others because normal physiological ICP, sorry for not mentioning this, is around 10 to 15 centimeters of water. But um, a tolerable but high ICP would be around 25. So a lot of people are hovering the 30 to 35 range, uh, would, would often have to deal with a lot of headaches uh, and nausea and, and all those things throughout their life. Um, and there, there is a chance though that it might get worse with older age because we see a lot of adults uh, getting this thing called normal pressure hydrocephalus where it's a more chronic hydrocephalus uh, where it acts over a longer period of time and before you know it you have much more severe symptoms uh, like a Parkinson's gait, uh, Alzheimer's dementia and on top of that incontinence all three at the same time have been observed in NPH patients. Yes? Is it plan to use a platform to like accelerate the neurological pressure oscillations to like speed up time to uh, failure estimation? Um, not exactly, it's, it's more or less to uh, see how the shunt performs, the smart shunt performs under those conditions, which are all at real estate time scales, um, and to see uh, what needs to be done in order to minimize uh, power consumption. Minimizing power consumption is really the first goal, um, and then I, I potentially see a future where we can do more long-term studies, where we see how uh, obstruction would build up uh, in the shunt and see how it responds over time. But ideally, the plan is to set up some uh, sort of a diagnostic system along with the shunt, such that even when small amounts of obstruction are detected, uh, the under drainage that results would lead to higher than normal ACP. So this electronic shunt will detect it right off the bat and will send up an alarm or some sort of signal. And that also brings me to uh, telemetry, which is another thing uh, that we hope to integrate with the shunt uh, at some point so the physician can access your ICP data and see if everything uh, inside your brain essentially is uh, you know, functioning normal.